to the Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing Series. I'm Tom Gilligan, Director of the Hoover Institution. Principles of individual, economic, and political freedom, private enterprise, and limited representative government were fundamental to the vision of our founder, Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover and remain as compelling to us now as they were more than a century ago. A preeminent research center, the institution has remained steadfast in its commitment to finding solutions grounded in history, data, and logic to many difficult challenges we face. The dissemination of our work has led to significant impacts on important public policy initiatives here and around the world. These briefings provide an opportunity to hear directly from some of our distinguished scholars on a wide array of domestic and international issues. Thank you for joining us and I hope you find value in today's discussion. As a reminder, we will be taking audience questions and I encourage you to submit yours using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. Today's discussion is with inter international development scholars, Stephen Haber and Alexander Goltovic. Stephen is, a, is the Peter and Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the AA and Jean Welch Milligan Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford University. He is also a Professor of Political Science, of History, and by courtesy of Economics, as well as a Senior Fellow of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. He is among Stanford's most distinguished teachers having been awarded every teaching prize available. Alexander Goltovic is a research fellow at Hoover and a senior fellow at the Universidad Adolfo Ibanez in Santiago, Chile. He has been an advisor on public-private partnerships to the Chilean government and multilateral organizations, including the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, and the OECD. Alexander is currently an advisor to the Chilean Ministry of Finance on COVID-19 policy and the implementation of massive testing to keep the economy open. open. Steve and Alex, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Alex, you're down in Santiago, right? So we'll give, a, give the Ethernet a little extra time to respond to your questions. How about that? Sure, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, throughout this series, as you guys know, we've looked a lot at how the United States has responded to COVID-19. Uh, given your international experience, I want to look forward. To, I look forward to discussing the response of countries around the world. And Steve, let's start with you. Uh, how have some of the what have been some of the different approaches used by countries around the world, and what are the lessons for the United States to be drawn from those examples? Oh, well, thanks, Tom. Uh, let me try to do this as briefly as possible to sort of permit time for Q and A later. Um, there have basically been four kinds of responses. The one that Americans are are most familiar with, especially those in California, uh, is a policy that you might call quarantine everybody, um, in which uh, shelter in place is put in uh, and only essential businesses are allowed to run. Uh, all policies involve trade-offs. That one has some trade-offs and I'm gonna come back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, another uh, approach has been to quarantine no one and in fact do nothing. Uh, uh, Brazil has sort of fallen into that group. Uh, the trade-off there is that if you have a disease that is highly transmittable uh, and that, uh, that would have um, uh, general effects on the population, you could quickly overwhelm a, uh, the, the healthcare system uh, such that mortality would spike. Uh, a third uh, approach which is, I think, perhaps best characterized by Singapore, but also New Zealand, uh, is a contact, uh, contact trace and test approach. Um, and the trade-off there is that um, you have to do this very, very early um, and uh, be before it disseminates into the broader population. Uh, and the trade-off is uh, twofold. Uh, one is that you have to be willing to accept a tremendous amount of government intrusion into people's lives um, because you have to force people to get tested whether they want to or not. You have to force them into quarantine even if they've tested negative because you're gonna continually test them for a two week period. Uh, and then you're going to pursue all of their, the people they came in contact with via cell phone. Uh, and it means you have to be able to monitor people's uh, cell phones and movements. So there's a, there's a, a civil liberties trade-off. There's another trade-off as well, which is that it is, uh, you never by design get to herd immunity. And so what you must believe in order for that to be a long run strategy is that a vaccine will soon be on offer. 
because as soon as those countries open up uh, foreign travel and open up commerce, they're going to have a recurrence of, uh, of cases. A final uh, approach, which is the approach taken by Sweden uh, to a somewhat lesser extent Germany and early on by Britain, but then abandoned by Britain, uh, is a strategy that relies on people's um, abilities to make decisions for themselves to voluntarily social distance without being uh, required to do so, without locking down the economy. So for example, in the Swedish case, schools have stayed open, businesses have stayed open, restaurants have stayed open, but the government has encouraged people to, uh, and in fact, the society has encouraged people to, to practice good, good hygiene. This strategy, the trade-offs are that it takes advantage of the fact that mortality risk and hospitalization risk from COVID-19 is not uniformly spread across populations. Um, COVID-19 is a very dangerous disease if uh, a person is uh, elderly or, and or has a number of comorbidities such as heart disease, uh, diabetes and the like. Um, and so the, the advantage of this strategy is that you do develop, they will develop herd immunity, so it doesn't rely on a vaccine. The disadvantage or the trade-off is they're going to accept more deaths and cases now for fewer cases and deaths in the future. When you asked about what the United States can learn from this, I think that one of the lessons that we're learning is that in a disease in which there is differential mortality risk by age and health status, that a generalized lockdown imposes a cost we haven't fully appreciated and that many public health officials haven't fully appreciated, which is that uh, the kind of general lockdowns we've had create mass layoffs, something in the order of 20% of the US workforce now. When a middle-aged person loses their job in a mass layoff, there is increased mortality risk, not just to that person, but to their families. So there's a wealth of literature and economics about the effect of a mass layoff on not just income, which involves for a middle-aged person a 20% permanent reduction, but a roughly 50 to 100% doubling of the mortality risk over the following year and an increase in mortality risk across the rest of their lives because of all the follow-on effects of reduced income. If the family gets pushed into poverty, then the effect becomes larger still because it hits the children. Um, roughly speaking, a child who grows up in poverty in the United States has a 10 to 15 year shorter lifespan than a child who does not. And so one of the things we need to be thinking about or one of the lessons to be learned here is to ask about trade-offs and not think just in partial equilibrium terms about the number of cases today. We've got to think about the health of the United States population on a going forward basis. Got it. Steve, thanks for laying that out. It's very clear. Um, Alex, let me turn to you. I mean, notwithstanding Steve's uh, comments about a big wholesale lockdowns having health effects as well as economic effects. Many people will characterize the Swedish style strategy as involving a trade-off between lives and money. Is that, is that an accurate criticism of the Swedish strategy? I think it's not an accurate criticism, uh, partly because of the reasons that Steve pointed out. Second, because uh, you have to consider that policies, what they can do is to flatten out the the curve of cases, but they cannot change significantly the number of total number of cases you will have, and so the number of deaths. What the streets have not been particularly good at doing is to take care of those who are uh, most at risk. And here we have to understand that uh, there is no such thing as your average uh, COVID risk. Uh, first, it's it's uh, it's very unevenly distributed across ages. So if you, have, if you are 60 or older, you have about your chance of, of dying of COVID if you get it. It's about 135 times the chance you have of dying if you get it and you're under 40. And if you're over 70, it's 240 times and 350 if you're over 80. 
uh, even, uh, even within the same age group, you will see that people who are most at risk are, are those who have uh, comorbidity. They are they have hypertension, they have uh, high blood pre pressure, diabetes, or so on. So one, one, uh, one striking fact about Sweden and, and most countries in the world is that they haven't done a, par a particularly good job in protecting those, uh, those, age, uh, I mean, those people at risk. Uh, going back to the question of whether there's a trade-off of lives versus money, well, the, the answer is no. In the end, uh, in the end, if you have less uh, economic activity, you will have an incremental in increment in uh, in deaths in the future for all sorts of reasons that uh, Steve mentioned. Got it. Thanks, Alex. If you just joined us, I'm Tom Gilligan, and this is the Hoover Institution's virtual policy briefing with Stephen Haber and Alexander Veltovic. Um, Stephen, I have a question I want to get to. Uh, it's from Rick, and his question is, doesn't the Singapore model also require reliable testing very early? In other words, and, and let, me, let me kind of expand on that question, the contact testing, tracing, testing, quarantine model, uh, is that model very effective, say, in the United States now after we've had so many infection, infections? Well, I think Rick's question uh, goes to a very, you know, he's making it a very important point. Um, first, it means you... The, a, a contact tracing and testing strategy requires lots of the ability to test. Um, uh, I think that everybody knows the CDC did not do a very good job in terms of uh, developing tests. Uh, but it also means doing this very, very quickly. Uh, one of the characteristics of the places that were successful in the strategy, uh, like Singapore or South Korea or New Zealand, is that they moved very, very quickly. Because once the, once an a disease that is an unusual disease in the fact that a very large proportion, perhaps, you know, the estimates bounce all over the place, but it seems to be something in order of half of all cases are asymptomatic. Once you have a disease where half the cases are asymptomatic and it's disseminated into a, a population and now there are millions of people who have been infected that we know about, it is very, very hard to now switch to a uh, contact, trace, and test regime. Mm -hmm. um, that would have need to have happened much, much, much earlier. Yeah. Alexander, is there anything about Chile that would uh, impede it from adopting a contact, testing, tracing, quarantine model right now? Well, uh, I think that uh, first is, uh, as Steve said, I mean, the, the illness is already too uh, widespread. It doesn't mean that you don't need massive testing, but you need massive testing which is targeted to certain populations. For example, you, would, you need uh, constant testing of personnel who works close to elderly people and maybe also of, uh, of younger people who live with older people and take care of them. Uh, that's one. You need testing in certain, oper in certain operations like meat, meat packing plants or even construction sites. So uh, you, should, you should use testing in a way which is different one in which uh, testing is usually uh, used as, not as a diagnosis uh, tool, but rather as a risk management tool to prevent uh, contagions. And, and, and there you're playing with uh, larger numbers. And so your, so your policy is successful not if you prevent every single case, but if you prevent a significant fraction of them. Uh, so there's still room for massive testing, but not the massive testing that people have in mind, which is sort of that everybody gets tested and everybody gets tested all the time and every contact is traced. Uh, Steve, let me ask you a very general question and give a chance to think through how, uh, what the right policy should be. And, and the question is, what general theory of the appropriate role for government underpins different views about the right policy? Well, I think that, you know, this is a, a key question that uh, countries are grappling with, and I think that American citizens are all grappling with. Um, I think there's sort of two general, uh, general views. Uh, one view of government is that it's uh, supposed to solve all problems. Mm. Um, another view of government is it's supposed to address problems that cannot be um, addressed, collective action problems that cannot be adequately addressed by individual people's taking individual responsibility and making good decisions. Mm -hmm. So underneath the Swedish model is a view of human beings in which 
uh, there, the, the role of government is to simply to suggest to people what right. they should do and then rely on them to, uh, to assess risks and, and uh, operate uh, in their personal behavior accordingly. Um, a lockdown view, for example, assumes that people are not good at making decisions for themselves or that the, the uh, externalities that are generated by a particular problem are so big that they could not possibly be handled. Um, so I think underneath uh, the debate around COVID is actually a deep philosophical debate about what is the uh, appropriate role for government and how much how responsible can human beings be? Mm -hmm. There's a very interesting paper that uh, a colleague of uh, Alex's and I, Ross Levine, uh, at Berkeley has been working on, where he's, he's had access to cell phone data uh, without personal information on it, um, looking at what people have done before and after the official lockdowns. And one of the uh, things he finds is that even in the United States, there was already a lot of voluntary social distancing yeah. prior to county or state lockdowns going into place, that people were in fact acting like Swedes. Right. So that the incremental effect of a lockdown was actually very small. Uh, people had already endogenously adjusted. So there is this, uh, this vast different sort of philosophical difference that has tended to now, unfortunately, take on a partisan yeah. uh, characteristic in the US. Uh, and I think perhaps in other countries as well, and it's, it's getting in the way of good thinking about adjusting our policies as we go, as we learn. Yeah, yeah, sad. It's like many other things in, in America, right? You're either red or blue, and there's no room to talk about what the right solution is. Yeah, it's yep. a shame our policy here has fallen in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to remind everybody that you're listening to Hoover Senior Fellow Stephen Haber and Research Fellow Alexander Baltovic. You can find more research by Hoover Fellows at hoover.org. More questions from our audience, guys. Um, this one's for Alex. Michael asks, in light of Alexander's statistics about m m comorbidities and conditional probability of getting the disease, which Michael thoroughly embraces, why are we talking about shelter in place, contact tracing, et cetera? Why not just shelter in place those at risk? Uh, well, that's, uh, that's a very good question. And, uh, and actually, that's the qu it's, uh, uh, one wonders why governments haven't thought about this as a priority. Any policy you favor, be it uh, keep the economy open or uh, shelter in place, will need to take care of those most at risk uh, because simply it's impossible to avoid, fully avoid human contact. You can't avoid the contact between caregivers and the elderly in a nursing home. You can't avoid that the elderly need to eat and so they need to go and buy groceries and get uh, support from the outside. So it's a very good question and, and it's, it shows that uh, governments in a way have uh, failed to put the priorities, uh, to, to pick the right priorities. Uh, a significant part of a strategy should be to take care of these uh, risk groups and this is simply not happening in, uh, in most countries. Stephen, you have a comment on that? Or? Um, well, yeah, I agree generally with Alex that the um, that given what we know about this disease, which is it has a big differential impact on the elderly and those with comorbidities. I mean, this is a fact that no, that is not in dispute. Right. Um, that the a more efficient policy that causes less damage to the economy and less damage to mortality risk of everybody else from other things induced by unemployment and poverty is a smart lockdown policy or a smart shelter in place policy in which the elderly and those with comorbidities should not just shelter themselves in place, but we as other citizens should help them to stay sheltered in place. Yeah. It involves things like going shopping for an elderly neighbor. Yeah. Um, that, and that's not something government can do. That's something individuals uh, can do. Uh, but it does mean that the governments need to move, would need to move away from the sort of generalized policy of uh, sheltering everybody in place, which uh, 
is very inefficient um, because of all the, the, the follow-on feedbacks on the rest of public health. It also, incidentally, the, a policy of sheltering everybody in place, mm -hmm. in which you're, something Alex mentioned is very, very important here. You can't affect the, you can affect the slope of the curve. Remember, flatten the curve? Right. That was about it affecting its slope. It wasn't about affecting the size of the, of the area under the curve, that is the total number of people who get sick. So the longer we all shelter in place, the longer those who are vulnerable are at risk because we don't get to herd immunity. What shelter in place for everybody entails is the belief that a vaccine will soon be available. If it's not, we're prolonging the period of time in which those most vulnerable are at risk. Got it. Here's a follow-up on, on your discussion about Sweden, and either of you could, could address it. Could you comment on the mortality rates in Sweden relative to the considerably lower rates in Denmark and Norway and Scandinavia generally? What's that about, and does that augur uh, against the wisdom of the Swedish policy? Well, I'll say something and then I'll, I'll give Alex a, uh, the floor. I, I think that one thing people need to bear in mind is the Swedish policy, that any policy is about numbers of deaths today versus number of deaths in the long run. That any policy around COVID-19 has to be what economists would call a long run equilibrium. And they all involve trade-offs. And so this trade-off the Swedes are making is to accept hot, more people getting infected today and higher mortality as a percentage of the population today for the ability to be resilient in the future, to have lower mortality in the future. And, the, and, the, and other countries that have taken a more aggressive, let's say lockdown approach, are trading fewer deaths today but are open to the problem of more mortality in the future unless a vaccine is very soon on the horizon. Uh, it goes to this issue about you can affect the slope of the curve, but not the area under the curve. Got it, got it. So let, let me, Alice, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, yes, I mean, two things. One is that uh, a policy like the Swedes you will see more deaths at the beginning. Second, as said, the Swedes have not been particularly good at caring uh, on uh, high-risk groups. Half of their deaths come from nursing homes, so they could have done a much better job there, and they're learning uh, from, uh, from what their mistakes. And third, again, that the Swedish policy, uh, I mean, you, you have places that, are, uh, that have uh, uh, imposed lockdowns that did very much worse than the Swedes did, uh, and they are struggling to figure out how they are going to open up now. Uh, the Swedes have a long-run strategy, and it's known what that strategy involves. Most places that do shelter-in-place policies, they are really they really don't have a long-run exit strategy, uh, which we know exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, so the, the 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 lockdown strategy is a bet on a vaccine ultimately, and that you will be able to avoid uh, certain infections and deaths later on. The cost of that, what you have to pay to make that bet, though, is more in this location, unemployment, and the kind of uh, medical effects that have. We have some questions along those lines, um, Stephen. I'll just read these. Um, to what extent is the increase? Uh, mortality and morbidity you're seeing now due to unemployment primarily attributed to lost income. And in the face of that, does the German policy of maintaining incomes despite unemployment have a serious impact on morbidity? In other words, can you counter those kind of lost wages, lost income numbers with fiscal policy? In the short run, you certainly can. And that has been, so keep in mind that the long, that the, the impact of unemployment and um, poverty is not felt immediately the way it is felt, let's say, from uh, someone at risk, at high risk, getting COVID-19. Um, and so in the short run, 
a policy, uh, a fiscal policy that dampens the effect of unemployment mm -hmm. uh, is going to lower the mortality risk of the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. I think the key here is that, that that's not a long run sustainable strategy. Mm -hmm. um, in order to be able to pay uh, the kinds of um, uh, unemployment compensation that we're currently paying, for example, uh, $600 a week on top of state unemployment, um, requires economic activity yeah. because there's got to be something to tax. So just to the degree that you lock things down, you hinder the ability in the long run to generate the economic surplus that creates tax revenues that you could then use to dampen the mortality consequences. Mm -hmm. So in the short run, yes, and in the long run, no, because killing the economy comes at the cost of a fiscal crisis, which we're now beginning to see in certain states in the United States. Yeah, here's a, here's a very interesting question and it kind of takes us out of the moment. <laughs> and ask us to think about the next pandemic, right? Uh, and it's a question from Jim. What are the time constants involved in a smart policy, quote unquote? In other words, he says, it's easy to look back and see what we should or could have done now, but much of that was informed by the experience with SARS, which much, with much higher levels of contagion and mortality. As each pandemic is new, how much time does it take to accurately assess and properly respond to what we are actually dealing with? Hey. I think the question is broader than that. It's, the question is how able are modern governments and the governments we have now able to deal with something like this? And uh, the response to COVID-19, I think, can be accurately described as a panic response uh, in most places. And uh, a very, uh, instead of realizing that you have to learn uh, doing, uh, it, it has been fairly acrimonious debates all, uh, almost in every country about what's the right policy. The few countries that have avoided that uh, and uh, they tend to fare better and uh, we see Germany, we see the Nordic countries and we see Sweden that have, they seem to have some answer to this and, and, and it's related to the fact that they somehow seem to be able to do collective action uh, in a way that it's much better and much better than the rest of the world. So I think the broader question here is uh, how able are our governments now to deal with, uh, with these pandemics and even other issues which require collective action. Hmm. And uh, it doesn't look very nice, actually. Yeah. Steve, do you have any comments? Well, yeah, I, I, I think this is a really important question. And I, I think that if there's a lesson to be taken away uh, from this experience, uh, it is that um, the more that government response and the more our response as citizens to an issue like a pandemic becomes partisan, um, the more we hinder ourselves to learn and respond adequately. Early on, um, there was very little known about COVID-19. As more and more got known, um, this became an increasingly partisan issue in the United States in which battle lines sort of got drawn and in which the people stopped listening to each other. And so the, it, it, it gave rise to a, a collective response, both mm -hmm. within the government but also outside the government that's been very inefficient and harmful to us as a society. Hmm. Um, I, I think if, that, if there's a takeaway about the next pandemic, it's that it's on all of us uh, to not make this partisan. Yeah, amazing. To, really to listen and to learn uh, and to adapt. Got it. Uh, let's, let's talk about policy now in the United States and policy in Chile. Where should we go from here? Alex, why don't you talk? What's, what's Chile's best strategy going forward? Well, you have to, um, aside from the political situation in Chile, you, a strategy needs to deal, a government strategy needs to deal with three things. One is that 
um, gov the government has to calm down the population and get the message through that the risk of COVID, which COVID poses to different persons, is different. It's almost a person by person uh, uh, issue, even in old age groups where uh, who are much more at risk than younger people. Uh, the second part uh, of, the, of the response is that you need specific policies that address and take care of, uh, of um, groups and people at risk. It's, it's more than groups at risk, it's people at risk uh, by, uh, for example, in nursing homes, by testing the caregivers that interact on a day-by-day -day basis with the, uh, with the elderly. So you need to have a specific policy that works there. You need to have specific policies for the elderly that live, uh, that they live on their own. And the third part is that the reopen reopening should be a strategy that uh, need, requires constant thinking. Uh, it's a strategy that has to be gradual. Probably it has to distinguish between those at risk and those who are at risk. Under 40s, for example, there's no good reason for not having them working uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the near future, but you need to combine that, th that uh, approach with, uh, with uh, taking care of those who are most at risk. So that you, you don't have a massive uh, health, health uh, problem and the hospitals getting uh, congested. Steve, the U.S. going forward, what should, the, what should our policies be? Well, I think the first thing we need to recognize is that my hometown of New York and uh, the small town in Nebraska where Alex went to high school uh, are two very, very different places. Uh, and uh, policies in a country as diverse as the United States uh, in terms of the density of population and the uh, demographic characteristics of the population need to be tailored to those particular situations. Uh, what we did essentially in most of the big parts of the United States was apply uh, a policy for appropriate perhaps for New York City to uh, the town where my daughter lives in the Sierras, the town of rescue, um, which uh, has, I don't know, a couple thousand people living in it. Um, this can't be the right way for us to go forward. Mm -hmm. Rather, uh, I agree with Alex that the uh, the, the, the appropriate thing to do is move away from general lockdowns so that the economy can function again, not because we want to trade dollars for lives, but because we want to have a sustainable policy of protecting lives of everyone in the long run, because with poverty comes and unemployment comes mortality. The other thing that we also need to do uh, on a going forward basis is have selective um, or smart shelter in place for the people at risk um, and uh, contact tracing for the people who come in contact with people at risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of questions along the lines of um, healthcare systems vary across countries. Some are, are single payer systems, some are more private like our own. Also the demographics of the populations are very different. So the US has a much more heterogeneous population than the, than the Nordic countries. Uh, speak a little bit about how those differing initial conditions are weighing into your assessment of what the right policy should be. Um, I don't know, and I'm gonna, uh, I'll defer to Alex here in case he, he may have different views, um, but my sense is that the, the, the differences in whether you have a single payer system or you have uh, a, a kind of mixed system like we have in the United States, that doesn't appear to have had a big effect on um, mortality rates. Yeah. Um, the, and in fact, outside of Italy, um, there's not a lot of evidence for hospital systems have be, having become overwhelmed, including in New York City. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that that's a variable that's, that's been crucial here. Um, there is obviously uh, an imp a differential impact, uh, not just of COVID-19, but of many diseases, 
that the differential in part is age, of course, and demographic structure. Um, part also is the um, um, level of income of the population. So a uh, higher income family is in a better position uh, to, uh, to sustain a, a, a shock to health uh, of, this, of this variety than a lower income family. Um, that's, uh, and so that is a, that is a difference. And, and in fact, the, the, you know, the evidence in the US is that there's been differential mortality risk, not just by age, which has been substantial, Sure, and not just by um, um, uh, by comorbidities, but also by income. And now some of that sort of there's a collinearity between income and comorbidities. But it, what it does say is that um, countries need to to learn about their own, not just the demographics of the entire country, but of local demographics to tailor the right set of policies, the right approaches to mm -hmm. problems like this. Yeah. Um, and to not go for one size fits all uh, approaches, but to be mindful of the fact, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't take into account everything that you know about a disease. For example, the, the differential effect on uh, by age yeah. in order to tailor a policy. Got it. Alex, you have any comments on that question? Yeah, what strikes me about uh, responses to COVID in the world is that a uh, few countries seem to have few health systems, regardless of whether they were single payer or, or, uh, or like, the, like the US or uh, rely on private or public, they didn't figure out quickly that there was a huge uh, risk differential across age groups and that certain uh, age groups and particularly within certain age groups, take nursery and, and especially nursery homes, that they had to be uh, taken care of very quickly. And uh, to some extent, that's still the case. I mean, the, it, it, it doesn't seem to be that this lesson has been learned in most countries in the world and that they have, and that health systems has, have adapted to that. So I, I'm not sure that uh, the type of system we have now has something, uh, has, has had an, a, a differential impact across countries. I would tend to think that the way that public health issues are viewed from, uh, from the public health establishment is far, far more homogeneous across the world and varies far less uh, with the financing of the public, of the uh, health system. Yeah, got it. One final question just to, to end us up. Um, suppose you look into the future, 18 months, three years, five years, whatever you want, and we ask ourselves what, country, what policies work better and we look at things like mortality rates or excess mortality rates, which may embed some of the economic stressors on public health. What kind of policies do you think would have turned out to be the most effective to deal with the COVID-19 threat? So if you look at what's been done around the world um, and what would have been most sort of appropriate, let's say in the US case, I think that um, the country that is probably going to wind up, and so this is a, a hypothesis, it's a bet rather than a statement of fact, is that I would bet on the Swedish economy and Sweden doing better in the long run. And the reason is that they now don't have to figure out how to open up because they never closed down. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, have kept the economy going. Uh, and so they're going to, they have a long run exit strategy. And if a vaccine does not appear quickly, they've gotten, they will get by then have gotten by the fall, have gotten to likely gotten the herd immunity such that they're in a resilient position to begin exporting again, because this is a economy that's sort of geared towards exports. That's going to be much harder for places that shut down and have stayed shut down because every time they open up, they're, they're again at, at, uh, at, threats, at threat of reinfection and there's the danger of uh, shutting down and damaging the economy again. And I wanna, but I wanna make it very, very clear here that the Swedish approach isn't just going to be better from the point of view of the economy, it's gonna be better from the point of view of the long run public health of the Swedish population. 
Mm -hmm. And that is, so the idea that, you know, dollars are getting traded for lives, as Alex said before, is absolutely not the right way to think about it. It's lives now and lives later. Yeah. Alex, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, I mean, everything you can say now is a guess, of course, but uh, I, I think that uh, countries which are naturally disposed to collective action and countries in which issues that they're used to think about, think through the problems they have in front of them, uh, they're going to fare much better than countries that uh, in which there are huge divisions and uh, huge dispersion of opinions of what to do about central policy questions. Uh, I think uh, the difference between Sweden and the US is not only about COVID, but it's also about how the political debate has been going in the direction it has been going in the US and it has been going in Sweden. Uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, even though the lockdown versus not lockdown issue is uh, more or less a liberal conservative issue in many countries, Sweden has a social democratic government. Uh, so, so I think countries in which they recognize that there is uh, some place for personal responsibility and also a need of collective action, these are the countries that are going to do better in the future, especially because by now pandemics will be part, it's like a bit like 9-11, right? I mean, the 9-11 changed completely the way security has, uh, has, has been uh, approached. And uh, there is no doubt that COVID will change the, the way we think about public uh, pandemics and public health issues. Well, fantastic. Stephen, Alex, thank you so much for the discussion today. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Great. Our next two of our virtual policy briefing will be Tuesday, June 9th at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern with Robert Service, who will be talking about Putin's Russia threat or opportunity. In addition to being a noted Russian historian and political commentator, Bob is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a fellow at St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. His research interests concern Russian history and politics and in all aspects from the late 19th century to the present day. You can join the briefing by using the same link as you use today. And you will find, find the Hoover Institution online at hoover.org and on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Again, thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful weekend.